Hello and welcome to the Athena 40 podcast, Bouncing Back. I'm Elizabeth Filippouli, founder of Athena 40, an international platform promoting female leadership and connecting individuals from all over the world to exchange knowledge and insights. In this series, we're interviewing thought leaders, entrepreneurs and decision makers from the international arena. And we're bringing you insights related to developments triggered by the coronavirus crisis. We speak with pioneering women from across different industries and countries. My guest today is Caroline Casey. Caroline is an award-winning social entrepreneur. She's also an Ashoka Fellow and young global leader of the World Economic Forum. Her latest initiative, The Valuable 500, is an ambitious year-long campaign to get 500 businesses to pledge to put disability inclusion on their leadership agendas. Launched at last year's World Economic Forum Annual Summit, Casey succeeded in bringing disability inclusion onto the main stage at Davos for the first time ever with the support of global business leaders. This lady is surely a force of nature. Caroline Casey, welcome to Bouncing Back. Hello. I would like to ask you, first of all, to share with us a bit about your story, which is a story of courage, determination, activism and values. Um, I think my story is a story of grit and stubbornness. Um, Essentially, I have been working as a social entrepreneur in the disability business inclusion space for 20 years. Uh, 20 years ago, I was a management consultant with Accenture and I came out of the closet. Um, I had hidden from Accenture that I was registered blind. And uh, in the year 2000, I came out and told them that I had a condition called ocular albinism and was not able to see two feet beyond my nose. Now, the story is a very strange story because um, I had been born with this rare condition and um, my parents made a very, I think it was brave and uh, um, a very brave decision when I was about three and a half years old um, to send me to uh, a normal school and to try and bring me up um, as a sighted child without telling me I had this eye condition and not defining my life by a label of disability. So I went through all of my school years believing that I was just a little girl who wore glasses like many other little girls who wore glasses. And I discovered about my very low vision at the age of 17 um, when my father gave me a driving lesson uh, for my 17th birthday because I'd always had these very big dreams to be a biker chick and uh, to race cars and to be a cowgirl and to be Mowgli from the Jungle Book. They were all big adventure dreams. And obviously, as you can imagine, when um, I received this driving lesson as a gift, I was to discover then that I would never drive a car. I should never have been cycling a bicycle um, and that I had this disability. And at 17, I just wasn't ready. Um, I didn't understand um, and I had seen how disability was treated um, because this was in 1989 and um, I decided to hide it from the world and I did very successfully so for 11 years until I was with Accenture. So how did that impact the way that you um, were dealing with yourself but also dealing with other relationships with other people? Did you share it? with anyone as in your close friends or did you decide to to hide it completely from anyone outside your family who knew i really the full extent of my vision i shared really with nobody um and i think anybody listening you don't have to have a sight impairment or a disability to understand the kind of the struggle with self-acceptance and um, I think so many of us carry secrets because we so, we yearn to belong. Um, and I think I was so worried that 
if I fully declared about my sight loss that people would treat me differently and I wanted them to see Caroline and I have this quite wild rebel streak in me and um, with low vision um, I misinterpreted at the time that it would mean that my personality would be diluted that my I would have to depend more that people would see me differently. So I shared small bits as if I just had very bad short sight, but I never, ever declared the extent to which I needed help. I never asked for help. Um, I learned to be very resourceful. I learned to detract um, away from my vision. And if you ask me how it affected my relationships with people, um, I think I, I adopted a strategy of, of being very extroverted um, and um, always like um, overcompensating to try and hide my sight, pushing myself very hard. I think a lot of us as women are very hard on ourselves and, and I think we can all relate to that, but I definitely do. I was also a people pleaser. So I, I'm recovering from the disease to please. So there was a lot of that. Um, and if you can imagine if you can only feet, see sort of about two feet. And I mean, I did archaeology as my degree and I went into business school and I got a first in business school and I went to Accenture. There was nothing that would have ever, ever let you understand that I had very low vision or I was registered blind. And even today, you know, my husband and my family, they still, they find that they forget, you know, um, because I have these strategies that I've used to deflect all my life. But I'm in a much better place now um, because it's 20 years since I'm out of the closet. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm much, I'm much further along in the journey of self-acceptance. And I'd have to say, I, I really quite like myself now, which is not maybe something I, I would have felt about myself 20 years ago. Before we get to today, um, I would like to ask you, what was it? What was the, the factor or the uh, key moment that made you uh, think or believe or accept that it was not the right way forward? What made you change your mind and decide to disclose to the world that uh, you have been dealing with this disability, uh, something that no one ever could have guessed? I remember in October of 1999, we had come back from traveling and I realized that I was very irritable and frustrated and I would even say probably angry and I didn't like myself I didn't I didn't like how I was turning up you know and I feel inside me is this positivity and this joy bubble you know um I dance a lot and people would say I'm like pure joy on a dance floor <laughs> to wild mm -hmm. abandon and if you think about these dreams that I was talking about about being Mowgli for the jungle book and a cowgirl you know I'm a very free spirit and I just remember early October of 1999 going I don't like who I am because I'm not being who I am I'm not being me and I, and I realized that it, it had all got so caught up in my head and I was so tired of pretending that I was okay. And I really wasn't. And, and it just, I remember, I remember the day very well, um, you know, sending an email to the head of HR in Accenture and saying that I needed to meet them. It just, it came to me. Do you know what I mean? I, I, it just, it rose in me. I just didn't like who I was. How did it feel afterwards? Did you, did you ever, uh, I assume you didn't, but I'm just feeling like asking the question, did you ever regret it? Were there any moments afterwards that were like, oh, why did, why did you share it with the world, uh, Caroline? Yeah, I mean, I certainly for the few months after, um, I had told the lady in HR, I really regretted doing it because I was so confused, you know, I mean, I was defying, you know, I was 28 years old and I had one particular path and I, so I just didn't know where I was. I was confused. But now I am so regretful that I didn't disclose earlier because mm -hmm. when I came out of the closet and when I opened up about my low vision and when I started accepting it, I mean, my life has truly transformed. And I don't mean in a perfect way but in just so much more of an honest way. And my life and the things that I have done with it are, is so much bigger than the life I was leading beforehand. It's like I set myself free. Um, and 
it's not that it has been perfectly successful. I've had so much ups and downs and failures and successes, but you know what? I, I, I really started to feel alive when I accepted I couldn't see. Um, and there's a beautiful song that Faithless do. Um, it's a lyric that says, when you don't need eyes to see, you need vision. And I really think that I opened up my vision for the work that I did, I've been doing for the last 20 years. Um, and so it's an incredible thing to have regretted it for those first few months. And now I just regret that I didn't do it sooner. So it was a form of internal, perhaps, awakening for you. And what I'm thinking here is that the COVID-19 pandemic has triggered for everyone a different type of awakening. So many people are currently finding themselves as being temporarily even disabled. And I will include here, for example, the lack of access to services, lack of access to a routine that people used to enjoy, take for granted. I will also include the psychological impact, which is exacerbated by fear and frustration. And consequently, it evolves into an enemy from within. Are we now seeing, Caroline, a stronger argument for a world that is rooted in accessibility and inclusion? Well, I'm an optimist. So, and having lived through personally quite a lot of struggle, I think from great pain or um, great struggle can come positive disruption. And I think we, it is, we all must make sure that what's happened now helps us reset or re-architect our society and our businesses and our systems to be fully inclusive. I am not inclined to believe with people who say, this has been the great leveler. I don't see it like that. Actually, I feel like it's been the great expose um, of the massive inequality in our world, but that means it is also a great opportunity. Um, we have all had the sense of, of isolation and exclusion and that might make us understand more what it is to be excluded, what other people take for granted. But I think we're going to have to work very, very hard on it because I've heard what really has bothered me in listening to many conversations around the pandemic. I've heard people say, well, this is really a gender pandemic or a race pandemic or a disability pandemic, saying it's affecting this group one more than the other. And I don't see that. I really see this as about money. This is about the haves and have nots. And it worries me when we start claiming this pandemic to one group of people, because I feel that this categorization or this ide war identities have stopped us looking at a fully equitable world for all. And so my hope is that we just, we see that we're all part of one human family and one human race, and we are all allies for each other. And I think that is, my real push is we all know what isolation has felt like in different extremes. We've all had our freedom taken away from us. And I just, in, in the work that I do, is just to say a lot of people with disabilities have been living like this for a long, long time. And what occurs to me is this system, the business system, let's just look at it, has changed very quickly and it has adapted to remote and agile working. So why would it not do that now for people with disabilities moving forward? And yet, the needs of people with disabilities have been overlooked. And that's scary. And the reason I believe they've been overlooked is because the value of the 15% of our population who have a lived experience of disability to our society is also overlooked. And um, I think this is a moment for us to really push for that to change. Well, talking about change, um which now is happening in front of our very eyes, whether we like it or not. Uh, I think that we can only drive real progress on disability, inclusion, accountability, by ensuring that the private sector takes their accountability tasks seriously. When business leads, as we know, society follows. And currently, our public systems, our governments, the world over, are really under a tremendous pressure, financial, uh, practical pressure to deliver. I would like us to talk a bit about your uh, Valuable 500 campaign, which is your latest project and a global campaign that is uh, doing an effort to engage 
the private sector in this accountability journey, which is now becoming more um, imminent and more needed than perhaps ever before? Well, I think when I came out of the closet um, all of those 20 years ago, um, I mean, this is how I, I came into this work. I, I was astounded that I was one of the 1.3 billion people in the world who had a lived experience of disability. And I, I realized that not only my own disability, I had discriminated against it. I also realized, or I came to know the huge inequality crisis facing people with disabilities. And I'll be honest, in the last 20 years, we've had the UN convention, of course, it's the 30th anniversary of the American with Disabilities Act, and yet we are still seeing gross marginalization and exclusion of people with disabilities. And from the outset of my knowing of this, I just could not understand how business was not part of the solution because the inequality crisis is just too big for governments and charities alone to resolve. They, they can't do it. And, and we believe that business is the most powerful force on this planet. And if business includes, society includes. And if business values, society values. And so that has been my work for many, many years. And it was on the death of my father in 2017, frustrated because I hadn't seen accelerated change. You know, I, I, you know I've stood by and watched, you know, I shared a stage with Sheryl Sandberg when we did our TED Talks in 2010. And I was fascinated by the power of a leader and business brands and, pla and really big platforms and what you could do with that. And I was like, I want to do, I want to do the lean in for disability business inclusion. And so when my father died, I think through the grief, the loss of him, um, and I really thought, my gosh, I would regret this if I didn't try. We launched the Valuable 500. And in essence, the, the intention behind that is that if we want to engage business meaningfully, we believe that you need to get it from the CEOs first. Because biz business leaders, the CEOs make choices. Those choices create cultures. And we discovered that 54% of our company leadership boards had never had a conversation about disability. And so if we really wanted to get business engaged, we needed the leaders. So the Valuable 500 went out to get 500 of the world's most influential brands and their CEOs to make a personal commitment, not a pledge, a personal commitment to have a leadership conversation about disability, make a commitment to action, and communicate that commitment to action both to the public and employees. And so it didn't matter if a company, where they were in their maturity of disability inclusion, what it was was to get to build this 500 strong community to be this sort of collective change using, using that collective power and influence to call out what we needed to do. And then once we build the community, we move from a campaign to a five year roadmap for change. When we get these brands and their business leaders to, to really be accountable for change internally in their businesses and externally in the business environment, to drive change. And this is for people with disabilities as customers and suppliers and talent and members of the community. It's not just about employment. It's really looking at stopping disability from being the sidelines of business and the DNI agenda, which it has been for too long. And it is terrifying to me that, you know, 90% of our companies boast that they're passionate about diversity and inclusion, and yet 4% only consider disability. And in my mind, that is a delusion. It's an inclusion delusion. And so what we're trying to say is, look at what you do under the other areas of diversity and inclusion and integrate disability and inclusion into that. Because I am both a woman and have a disability. You know, the intersectionality of all of the differences of us, I think that's where the really sweet spot is and stop categorizing the humanity against each other. There is no hierarchy for inclusion or exclusion. And we all need now to be allies for change for each other. And I think this is where COVID, I think, is the greatest opportunity to look at universal human inclusion. When you spoke um, at Davos last year and you talked about this, uh, this need to change the world when it comes to 
how we uh, we approach disability, how we um, give people uh, opportunities and access to uh, to being able to thrive regardless of whether they are disabled or not. And when I say disabled, I also mean lacking access to technology perhaps, or lacking access to education. Uh, did you feel that uh, the audience, uh, which of course, as we know, the World Economic Forum consists of this world's leaders, business leaders, did you feel that they listened carefully and that they left, if you like, ready to implement this change? Well, firstly, I mean, we had credibility because Paul Coleman is our chairperson, you know, the ex-CEO of Unilever, and essentially the CEO who founded Sustainability and the chair of Global Compact and then the International Chamber of Commerce, and he's chair of the B team. I mean, we had a very credible chairperson and our very first leader. And with Omnicom and Virgin Media and One Young World, we had these incredibly strong strategic partners. And we were given the main stage of the World Economic Forum, who are now our partner. So to answer your question, do they take it seriously? Well, this is the answer. We have 268 signatures of some of the biggest CEOs in the world and their brands. We are over 50% there. They have given, each of them have given us a commitment, which you can go and see on our website. And not only that, is there asked, they are the ones who asked us to do a second stage to create a roadmap. Was it scary at the beginning? Yes, I can't deny it. On the 24th of January, 2019, my legs were shaking at our press conference. But I was sitting with Julie Sweet of Accenture and Peter Grauer, the chair of Bloomberg, and Paul Coleman and Carolyn Tasted of Procter & Gamble, knowing I had Virgin Media and Microsoft behind us. Within a week, we had 10 of the biggest companies in the world. And do I think it's easy? No. But what I'm definitely seeing is by the creation of this community, safety in numbers, is actually everybody knows that we are here to help the business system change. We're not here to shame. We're here to share best practice, to get there quicker, better, faster. And our intention, and I think the energy behind the Valuable 500 comes from a really strong combination of head and heart leadership and like stats and story. And I think we have created a, I don't know, a kind of contagious environment for change. And even through COVID, we are getting companies joining us every day. Um, and I think they're the companies who are seeing that they're going to have to change now. And it's better to do it in community with the Valuable 500. So that's the positive oh, side. But the hard side is captured in a film called Hashtag Diversish, which is three minutes long. And I'd suggest anybody should go and look at it. It's on YouTube. We have had to battle three great things. One is that Many DNI people would say, well, this year we're focusing on gender or LGBTQ. And you're like, do you know how crazy that sounds? So that's the first thing. The second thing is there still is really a lack of understanding of the huge opportunity around business, which is worth 8 trillion. It's about brand differentiation, innovation and growth. I think there's still a lack of understanding. And thirdly, what we really needed to battle against was that we didn't have the Sheryl Sandbergs. But now you see we have 268. <laughs> so I hope we're going to be able to change the other two factors fairly fast. And so if someone wants to join your campaign, support, sign up, endorse it, what do they need to do? And also, what does this commitment mean? Well, thank you for asking. Um, by the way, there are only 500 places in the Valuable 500. Um, anybody who's listening, who's working with a company that they think um, should be belong because it doesn't matter if a company is leading on this or beginning, but become part of it. It needs to be a company that has over a thousand employees across the globe. Um, it does not cost a company any money. It costs the company intention and will. The commitment means to join the community. The CEO must sign off, give their signature on a leadership conversation and a commitment to change. Whatever it is they want to do that's relevant to their country, their culture, or their industry. And we have loads of commitments you can see on our website. So 
small, big or large, it doesn't matter. It's the intention of the leadership. So that's to join the community. And then next year, when we launch the next phase, which is the roadmap for change, we re-ask our leaders to sign a man manifesto of engagement. And that is that they will pick areas of change that they will want to become part of. But to join the community right now, it's very simple. And my question is, to anybody, is why would you not want to join? It's, we've had very few no's, very, very few no's, um, because it, it, it really would, it would make you think why a leader or a company doesn't want to join. Because it's about saying, well, we don't want to have anything to do with disability. And so it is that challenge to them. Caroline, what is the first thing that you will do when the lockdown is over? <laughs> um, well, I'm very well known for being a hugger. Um, one of, <laughs> one of, in the Valuable 500, right in our, our logo is a big heart. Um, and often people have said, maybe part of our success has been my big heart and my emotion. And maybe that's true, but I've nearly hugged every CEO I've met. Um, I really, I so desperately miss um, physical contact with my parent, my mom, my, obviously my dad said, my family, my friends, um, and feeling people because as a visually impaired person, touch is so important. Um, and I'm so lucky because I'm living in, in my home here with my husband and his daughter and a very good friend of ours. Um, and we, we have that and it's, I have a garden and I have a beautiful home, but the first thing I want to do, I'd love to <laughs> go out on a massive hug fest. Um, and I think really play in nature. I'm desperately missing nature. Um, though I live near the sea, I just want to, I just feel like I want to run around and do grass angels and hug trees and swim and yeah, I really missing nature. Well, they say that tree hugging is one of the most soul soothing um, experiences, feelings, and I do love nature. Uh, I would like to thank you, Caroline, for this fantastic conversation today. You are leaving me very inspired and I'm definitely now uh, an ambassador for the Valuable 500. Well, thank you very much. And I really mean it. Every conversation um, begins a commitment to change and an action. And thank you for giving us this platform. I, I really do appreciate it. Keep well. I'm sending you for now a virtual hug until we meet. And I would like to thank everyone for listening to the Athena 40 podcast, Bouncing Back. Stay tuned. More episodes coming up. Please feel free to subscribe. Athena 40 is hosting conversations with thought leaders, entrepreneurs, influencers, and inspirational decision makers from all over the world in this effort to find our new normal. You can find more information on us on athena40forum.com. Follow us on Twitter on Athena underscore 40. Stay safe, stay inspired. Thank you.